Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino. I'm a psychotherapist, teacher, consultant, and most importantly, a wounded healer, living and working in Chicago, Illinois. On this show, I interview folks in a variety of healing professions, and we discuss the intersectional journey of healing self while caring for others. We're not just focused on individual healing, but also healing on the collective level from white supremacy, late stage capitalism, and the patriarchy. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you hear a little like in the background, there's construction noise. There's always construction noise where I live. I happen to be moving soon. I'm very excited, but very stressed about it. Very stressed about some other things happening in the world too. So as you may know, because I've mentioned before, I record this podcast well in advance of release. And so You may have been wondering if you heard our most recent episode in June, you may be wondering why I haven't said anything about Roe v. Wade, and it's because I have yet to get behind the mic until now. So I did want to mention the Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade, and I mean, I'm kind of speechless, but at the same time, not surprised. I'm, of course, sad and angry and fearful and all of the things. I haven't posted a lot about it on social media because I don't really yet know what to say. But the thing that I am I'm doing rather than speaking, I am trying to listen. And I've told you before about this podcast I listen to. It's just a daily news podcast and it's usually very brief. And I listened to an episode this morning where one of the news folks, news folks, what they're fucking journalists. Oh my God, I'm a ridiculous human. Okay, they're journalists. But they were talking about looking to voices in the queer, trans, and BIPOC communities who have already been fighting these fights for generations. And they mentioned uh, a person named Susan Stryker, and that's Stryker with a Y. Stryk- Susan Stryker with an I is a very different person. I was very confused why they were mentioning that person in relation to politics and uh, trans activism. But anyway, so Susan Stryker with a Y is a professor, author, and trans activist. And the quote that was shared on the podcast today was that minorities are often the most politically active people because they have the most to gain and the least to lose because of the marginalizations that we all go through. So I consider myself a woman and a queer person, but I'm also looking to others who have marginalized identities who've been fighting the fight for longer, right? We're looking at folks in the disabled community, the folks in trans communities, the folks in BIPOC communities. They've been fighting the fight all along. And I don't know, there's so much to say. I don't want to put all the burden on them and say, you know, go, go take all of their labor. But at the same time, they're the ones whose voices need to be highlighted the most at this time. And that's who I'm going to be listening to. So I'm going to be educating myself and hopefully meeting some cool people and learning from some cool people. And of course, I will share all of the wonderful tidbits that I learned from them. So. Another thing that I think is really important at times like these when it just feels like there's devastation and chaos everywhere is to find what brings us joy. And what brings me a lot of joy right now is knowing we are not alone, right? I'm guessing that if you're listening to this podcast, you are bent to the left and you're also struggling with everything that's going on right now. And so we're together. I am in a community in this embodied social justice course that I don't even know how many hundreds of people are in that. We're together, right? I have a community at Head Heart Therapy of, it's a small community, but it's therapists who are really interested in doing this work. We are together. So community is what is really bringing me joy right now. And I would love to hear from you what brings you joy at times like these. I don't think I've mentioned this from the mouth in the podcast yet, but we have a little voicemail recorder doodle uh, that we would love to hear from you. You can leave us voice messages at any time. You just go to speak-to 
That's T-O dot U-S slash convos with a wounded healer. And you can leave us a voice memo about anything. But right now, I would love to hear what it is that brings you joy. Before we move on to our guest, I just wanted to give you a reminder about a couple of things. If you love the show and want to support us financially and have the means to do so, you can find us on Patreon under Conversations with a Wounded Healer. You can give as little as a dollar a month and literally every donation is so special and so meaningful to me. And I send you a little welcome gift when you become one of our Patreons. You can rate us on Spotify. You can rate and review on Apple Podcasts. You can follow me at Head Heart Therapy on Instagram. There's so many ways that you can support the podcast and continue to help us share these wonderful conversations in a time that can feel really dark and hard. So that's all I have for announcements and exciting things like that today. So let's get to the exciting guest. Kira McCown. Kira is someone that I've known for a really long time and don't really get to connect with her very often. So this was an absolute pleasure for me. And let me introduce you to her. So Kira has been an avid mover and exerciser since the age of 12. She became a self-proclaimed gym rat by the age of 15. It seemed a no-brainer when she created a fitness and movement company in 2008 after receiving her personal training certification the year before. Since then, Kira has secured several certifications in the world of fitness and movement and loves talking about the incredible adaptability of the human body and how we can use our bodies to coach us through life. So you may be thinking, Sarah, you have a fitness instructor on conversations with a wounded healer. And I'm like, yes, 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 I know. On paper, that seems like it doesn't make any sense. But as soon as you hear Kira talk and all of the wonderful things that she thinks about in the world, you're going to be like, oh. This makes all the sense. So please enjoy my heartful, spirited conversation with Kira McCown. Huzzah, Kira. Huzzah, indeed, Sarah. (laughs) Welcome. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. How the hell are you? Thank you for inviting me. I can't wait to hear all of the ways that you're killing it. I'm killing it. I'm killing it. Yeah, I can't wait to, you know, learn them myself as I tell them to do right here, right now. Right here. That's usually, that's usually what I need is some reminding about how I'm killing it. You know, so right. it works. It works. I just book myself on podcasts and then I'm reminded over and over again. You're like, oh yeah, I am a badass. I, I forgot. I forgot. Listen to that badass. <laughs> <laughs> same girl, same, same. Yeah. Well... Let's start. And I am trying to remember exactly how we met. But do you remember how we met? Did we meet through uh, about women? Did we? Maybe. There were so many. I feel like we were destined to meet each other because we felt like we found each other in a lot of avenues. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did I do a Mary Kay party or something like that with you? No, no. I did not. No. no. <laughs> I, nope. I think you tried and I was like, no. Thank yeah. You. So I knew you. I knew you already then. Before okay. then. Okay. Or I knew you at that time. So it had to be about women. It had yeah. to be about women. Yeah. Because then we had Kathy in common. Because mm-hmm. Kathy was your client. She was my bookkeeper. That's right. Which I don't even remember how I met her. Who knows, right? We were destined to meet. Networking. Just getting around. Yeah, get around, girl. Just get around, right? That's what I do. (laughs) Well, tell people what it is that you do do other than get around. I mean, I feel like getting around is like kind of part of my job. Well, I've been a business owner since uh, the age of 25. I turned the big 4-0 this year, so. Woohoo, welcome. Welcome to the club. Yeah, I can't wait. Well, I can wait, but I'm super pumped about it. But yeah, so I've always been a business owner. So getting around is a, has been a huge piece of business ownership, especially um, because I've owned a business for almost 15 years now. Um, and it's been the same business. I've also owned other businesses as well. But yeah, no business will survive without getting around, at least a little bit. Mm-hmm. Luckily for me, I feel... Like my getting around was always built into the lifestyle I was already living anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of made it easier, too. So I'm an extreme extrovert. 
And it's a huge piece in business ownership. So I would say that's been the biggest piece of getting around. But the business itself is probably been the biggest piece of my whole adult life at this point in time, you know. So my business is called Comfy Fitness and we are a fitness company and we've had over 15 years, probably three or four different iterations of ourselves where we started and where we are today are two very different places. But I think that every single step was a 100% necessary step to get us to the next stage of business. So yeah, so the business I own today, Comfy Fitness, that's nearly 15 years old, is nothing like the business Comfy Fitness I owned 15 years ago. And it's nothing like the business Comfy Fitness I owned two years ago, pre-2020, right? Yep. right? Yep. And so all of that has been huge in how everything has unfolded and where I am today. Another company I own is called Kimbra. And Kimbra is, it's basically a business that creates space for people who are creating things in the world so that they do the things they know they need to do, but they do it inside of a focused community space. So most of the people this attracts are solopreneurs because so many solopreneurs mm -hmm. are really in need of community. They need to celebrate mm -hmm. their wins and there's not a lot of people to do that with when you literally work on your own. Yeah. You know, you have clients and stuff, right? But your clients aren't the same as like, you know, a business partner, for example, or a team, right? Right. And even a team isn't the same as like, say, uh, like a colleague or a friend or a peer. So, you know, that's what we create for our community members at Kimbra um, and just help in assessing what they're doing in their projects completing what's getting done and what's not getting done with themselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then moving into the next step because that completion piece needs to happen over and over and over again. And I think it's a big missing piece when we think about big projects that take time, like a business, for example. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say another big piece, gosh, there's so many things, dude. Another big piece of my, which is a part of like the wounded healer piece though, too. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you take a listen, you'll know. You probably know where, where I lean on all of this, but I'm also an activist and organizer in the city of Chicago and have been since 2009. I started my activism journey back in 2003 in, a, in like a kind of way, but then 2009, I really kicked up the reins and I've been involved in organizing and activism in Chicago since then. So if you check out the documentary, We're Not Broke, I'm featured in it. And that came out was in Sundance Film Festival back in 2009. Where can we watch that? Uh, I think on Hulu was the last place I knew that it was available. OK, um, so check it out. It's really cool. It was just before Occupy happened, which, of course, I jumped on that bandwagon and then campaigned for Bernie Sanders and also worked on getting money out of politics through a resolution to get a convention of the states together. So all kinds of work in the political spectrum. I'm now a part of the People's Lobby in Chicago, where basically we work for people, planet first sort of agendas. So that is a really big part of my life and has been a big part of my life for a while. And then I'd say the last really big piece and the piece that came a little later in life for me was the, uh, the husband and the kid. Right. Which is all fairly fresh and new and was never, ever, 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 ever going to happen without the healing journey that I've been on personally. Yeah. 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 So I got married like four and a half years ago and I had a baby just over a year ago. Congrats on the one year old. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. She's still alive. Good job. Pumped about that, right? Yeah. She, she smiles a lot. So that's good too. I'm Aww. just like, I'll take that as a clue that I'm doing okay. Mm. Um, Cause I don't want to fuck you up. <laughs> so. Right. Well, you will, just in a different way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hopefully she doesn't become a Republican, right? Yeah, like that that's would be exactly. The worst. That's what everybody says to me. They're like, <laughs> yeah. she'll become a Republican. That's how she's going to get back like, at you. No! <laughs> well, let's, I really want to weave the, like your healing journey and the somatics and the activism together. I think that's what my listeners are going to be most interested in. Right. So wherever you want to start with that, bring it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
because I didn't even mention what I actually do inside my business other than own the business, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously. Yeah. So I'm actually a conscious fitness guide and a somatics movement teacher. And what that means is I help people feel their bodies. So how is that useful? Why don't I begin by how I got into it personally? Yeah. So my business partner has always dealt with a massive amount of back pain, right? And inside of our training business, one of the things that we recognized about our methodology that we invented, it was that we were getting people very consistently and reliably out of pain. Mm. And now that I have all of the education that I have under my belt, I understand now why we were so successful at that with the methodology we were using. But I just created that methodology so it was easy for my trainers to make up workouts and programs for people. I didn't realize it was actually going to create this whole other thing where we were actually relieving people's pain. Mm. So we started moving in that direction with a lot of functional fitness forums and education and, and all of that. But nothing was really helping my business partner with her low back pain. And I was always hungry for more education, more information in how can I help people move more freely? You know, a great example is like, let's take a squat. The industry standard for a squat is that your thighs are parallel to the floor, right? Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically, like that's what you're aiming for, quote unquote. Is it? Mm Mm-hmm. Now I'm like, can I do that anymore? I bet you can. I've seen you squat. I guess I can. I I guess I can. (laughs) I don't know. It sounds harder when you describe it that way. I never way. forget to squat. <laughs> oh, good. My butt is burned in your brain. <laughs> yeah. So your listeners can't see me putting quotes like it's the industry standard, right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of that in fitness is changing right now because we're recognizing that bodies, oh my God, bodies are different. Can you believe that? Oh my God. Ableism? What? It's so wild. <laughs> so, you know, I would find that my clients would just not have certain ranges of motion and it wouldn't depend on anything like weight or height or gender. None of that mattered. Right. Just randomly because of injury, because of history, because of whatever, certain movements were just not available to people. And I was convinced there is no way that this is not adaptable in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so inside of my business partner's endless journey to find her back pain healing, she stumbled upon clinical essential somatics, which is basically a practice of releasing trained muscle tension, muscle tension that is sitting just beneath your consciousness. Mm -hmm. We don't know it's there. And there's all kinds of reasons our body holds tension without us knowing it. And one of the reasons just starting out as a somatics instructor that I was really after was like, okay, how do we unwind years of recovery from injury? Yeah. And so that's kind of where my journey started was like, okay, you were in a car accident. Now you have neck situations. Great. Why don't we look at how you're moving your neck, how you're moving your head? Oh, there's a stuckness. Great. Now let's go into that patterning and through our methodology in somatics called pendiculation, we can actually have a person identify and notice because without actually feeling or sensing something, we can't Mm -hmm. change it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's parallel in every single kind of transformational practice. It's like if you can't sense something, you can't change it. Yeah. And so that's what the practice is, is sensing what's there and then basically inviting the release of it. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started with that. What's really interesting about all of that is I started at around that time, probably just a couple of years before that on my own personal healing journey. So this all ended up intertwining and paralleling in such a beautiful and fortunate and serendipitous kind of a way. Mm -hmm. That's how healing works. I can't even express the level of appreciation and gratitude I have to how everything culminated in my favor. Mm -hmm. It's wild. And, you know, my journey was maybe not as common. I don't even really think I knew that I had a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a lot of people running around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
I had it all together, man. I was a 25 year old business owner. I mean, imagine the ego that like comes along with that. Right. And especially when you're me. (laughs) I'm a Leo with a Scorpio rising. Oh, like, forget about I love it. it. <laughs> Where's Jupiter? Do you know? Where is my Jupiter? Jupiter is in my first house. Oh, okay. All right. Expansion, expansion, expansion. Makes total sense, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And expanding the body because the first house is the body, which, holy shit, that's dead on. <laughs> it, it, my chart and I have such an advantageous chart like everything yeah, is like also in my favor it's ridiculous it's outrageous yeah I have a sense and I think that's where the political stuff comes in right yeah. my yeah. system to organize itself I feel like there's like a lot of shame and guilt honestly inside of all of that that was there oh yeah you know and I'd be like well I must have justice for everybody right and so all of that really leaped into who I ended up being mm-hmm. and so by the time I went to therapy first of all it was a gift to me from my business partner so that's so funny oh my god she's like here just slide this on the table <laughs> By the way, if you if you if you want to take this and she's like, please, God, please, God, go to therapy. (laughs) Just guessing. Because I've never been that person. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's so funny now that I think about it, like, oh, yeah, that's how I started. I got a gift of therapy (laughs) at the time I was cheating on my boyfriend I was just constantly doing drugs and drinking a bunch of booze, right? And I'm a fitness instructor. Mind you, the like dichotomy of the lifestyle that it takes. Mm -hmm. I was like full on party girl. Yeah. Party mode, nonstop. I'm a mud wrestler. I don't know if you knew that for the Mud Queens of Chicago. I saw you once. Oh, Oh, you did? Nice. I accidentally ended up at one of your gigs and I was behind a, like there was a fence. You were in some sort of area and there were tons of people in that area. And my friend and I stayed on the other side of the fence where there was a hole that we could look through. (laughs) And I watched you win wearing some like, I think it was like a Girl Scout uniform. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm Brownie yes. Bruiser. Yeah. So yes, I've I've seen your work. It's fantastic. Yes, that's all I do is win. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's always been a, a big piece of who I got to be, right? But back to, I don't know how we got there, but back to the somatics and the fitness piece. Oh yeah, that's right. Because I was doing my own personal healing at that time and just kind of honestly just learning that there was an issue. So what did your therapist say? Like, how did you come to this awakening of, oh shit, I am not in alignment? How did I come to that? Well. There was a piece of me, honestly, that just knew, oh, actually, this is hilarious. Oh, my God. Now I know. Now I know. So that was not it when I was that with that therapist. That therapist, Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened in that whole therapy scenario where I just don't. She wasn't good. I don't think that we clicked. Yeah. I don't think that there was there. No offense. Yeah. No, no, no. no, Yeah. None take it for me. But like, yeah. But some therapists are not good. Not all therapists are created equal. Well, and also, I don't know, sometimes I got the sense that there was a hang up on the fact that I was cheating, like in having an affair or something, you know, and that I was partying and I was doing all of the things that like you're not supposed to do. And I was working 100 hours a week and I'm completely out of my mind. Right. Oh, see, judgment. Yeah, I think that there was a level of judgment Mm -hmm. there because we didn't even end up getting into and I think we did 18 sessions together. We never got into my childhood. Yeah. Never even touched on it, you know? Hmm. So at the time, also, goddamn, there's so many things. At the time, I was also a Mary Kay lady, right? So, yeah, it's awesome. (laughs) So good. So good. I have this, like, image in my head of you, like, showing up hungover, cigarette, like, draped out of your mouth ding, 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 ding. with a Mary Kay like foundation caked to hell which you didn't do but that's like what I want to see in my head and you like have your fuzzy slippers on or something like that's the image that comes yeah. to me oh I was a badass Mary Kay consultant I would bring my Mary Kay party on my bike right 
Because I crashed my car, of course, because of course I crashed my car. Of course you did. After a mud wrestling event. So then I'm throwing my panniers on the back of my bike mm-hmm. with all my Mary Kay gear. And I bike to my Mary Kay appointments, man. I made it happen. <laughs> oh, I love it. So, yeah. So I was in Mary Kay. And here's, if you want to hear the honest God's truth of when I figured out that there was, that there was something missing. I do. Was when... I became a Mary Kay director alongside a couple of my friends who became directors and they were doing well and I was not. Hmm. And I was, and I did it for like 18 months and I'm just like, what the fuck? Right? Like I have the network. I have the looks. I have the personality. I'm mega smart. Like I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Why am I not succeeding right which is so funny because i feel like that was the only reason mary Kay mary Kay came along and i decided to go for directorship because i was perfectly cozy as a consultant making an extra eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month it's totally easy yeah and then i was like sure i'll go be a director with my friends so that i can show off how awesome i am and then like boom rubbing in my face month after month like why can't i make this work Mm. right and man that's when I was like okay I'm gonna go do something about this I'm gonna figure this out so where do business owners go to figure the shit out usually like these big fucking forums right and like Tony Robbins right that kind of shit I can't afford fucking Tony Robbins I didn't go to Tony Robbins right I went to Landmark Worldwide which is also a cult but that's all right that I could afford right yeah that shifted everything though Man, everybody's like, oh, they're like, oh, are they brainwashing you? I'm like, yes, it's great. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I mean, it works clearly. Yeah. So then I went to Landmark Worldwide and that turned a lot of shit shifted. And you know what it was? It was seeing people's reactions to things when I would tell them about my childhood. Hmm. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, this one time this happened and then this happened. And people were like, ooh. Right. And I'd be like, and you're like, what? That's not normal. That's not how parents treated the children. That's weird. Right. Or the other side of it, because there's all this sharing. Right. Because if you ever do landmark, you've got to be OK with other people sharing a lot of information about themselves. Right. Because you don't have to share shit. Right. But like mm-hmm. people get up there and they share a lot of shit about themselves. Right. And if you're uncomfortable with it, that could be interesting, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, people get up. They share all these things about themselves. They would talk about it and they would call it abuse. And my little mind would go, you call that abuse? That's nothing, right? Nothing, right? And then that's when I realized like, oh, like maybe what was going on in my household when I was growing up wasn't normal. Oh, and then maybe that actually had an impact on who I ended up becoming. Oh, and maybe that's why I act this way when this happens and this way when this happens and and so on and so forth. And Mm -hmm. that was really sort of the uncovering of like how everything unfolded. Everything from like my complete and utter hatred of men, right? Mm -hmm. And how Mm -hmm. mean I was to men. Mm. Like cutting off 50% of the population from even being able to have a (laughs) friendship with me. Wow. Well, and let's let's like pause to reflect on because I mean, there's yes, there's a lot of controversy about organizations like Landmark. Mm -hmm. But what I hear in the importance of what happened for you is you heard other people's stories. Mm -hmm. And if only we had a world where we were, I I mean, we actually kind of do. This is sort of what social media is, is, Mm -hmm. you know, where a lot of us are sharing what happened to us as children and how that impacted us. And then I love that other people naming their own abuse was what helped you look inward and go, oh, got it. That's very helpful. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it happens all the time, even now. Yeah. Right. So I went into my first landmark forum in August of 2014. And even to this day, people sharing their own experience it like it's so simple. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so simple. I mean, it's what 12 step is, too. And it's and it's lovely. And it's lovely because then 
not only does the person sharing get to be witnessed, right? It's like you have this opportunity to really discover something for yourself and about yourself. And also then because we grant so much more, I mean, and we don't grant that much to be sure, but we grant so much more space for other people and their crap than we really do for ourselves and our crap. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, when we can start to grant space on both sides of that spectrum, I think that's when real magic can come out. Yeah. And we can actually find not only like resilience and, you know, ways to get through things and coping mechanisms, but really finding ways to like thrive and find joy and everything that's on the other side of it for us. So, Mm -hmm. and maybe even enjoying the sadness and the anger and like being in a place where we can do that too. So, so yeah. Well, that's what being human is about, but we don't want that. It's also human to not want to be mm-hmm. sad and angry and deal with the trauma. It's such a conundrum, the human experience, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I love it. I'm here for it. <laughs> and I love it. And and I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have said that five years ago, but I probably wouldn't have said that six months ago. I was in my own really, really dark period six months ago. Forget about that. Three months ago. Right. I, w- I went through a really dark mm. period and that last like Omicron burst of COVID and yeah and all of the anger that I had toward freaking everything at that point in time you know do you think postpartum played any any part of it I think that yeah I think that the postpartum piece was it felt very separate from the COVID piece I feel Mm -hmm. like COVID actually helped me deal with the postpartum stuff because I'm a like I suffer from FOMO and so if <laughs> yeah. if I, if I can't go to the bars, none of you can. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that, right. that was kind of where I was. I was like, oh good. I'm glad there's nothing going on. I know. You know what's so fucked up though? And I'm curious if any of this has changed for you. Cause I was talking to my husband the other day, because I also consider myself a serious extrovert. But you even texted me not too long ago and you were like, hey, there's this event happening. And I was like, I'm not ready to be around people yet. And the thing Mm. is, I do not want to be around people. Mm. I feel like all of a sudden a switch was flipped and I am now an introvert and I cannot tolerate people. (laughs) And it's very unsettling because I've never been that way. Yeah. So you're not experiencing that at all. Okay. No, I'm not experiencing what my experience was three months ago. So I'm an eternal optimist, right? Which is why I've been able to be an organizer for as long as I have been. Um, But I'm an eternal optimist. And I think it's how I survived my childhood. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I I made jokes like that. I'm a Pollyanna, like I'm a total Pollyanna. Right. And then there was a period of time over the winter around the holidays and through the holidays, maybe even through January, where I was just like, I fucking hate people. Yeah. I think people are the worst. Yeah. And I was just like, that is something I would have never, ever, ever said. And I started saying things like, I'm losing my faith in humanity. Yeah. And it's like, and if I'm losing faith in humanity, man, I don't know a single person who had faith in humanity to begin with other than me. Right. 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 So that's really scary to me. Springtime has done a lot to like help me emerge out of that space. But also there have been some things that have unfolded just in my more immediate space. Choices that I've made to shift that way of thinking. Like I've started taking steps to take myself out of, you know, an activity that I've been doing weekly for about two years. That's just creating a lot of that darkness Mm. for me. And, and, you know, not that I don't enjoy the activity. It's a politically motivated one. It's just, I can do similar things and not have to deal with the darkness of the world. Yeah. You know, because I'm a community organizer and I'm doing political commentary on like national news right now. And I've been doing it for two years. And while national news is all well and good and I'm interested in it and I like to listen to it, I don't want to have to. Yeah. And when I pay too much attention to national news, I don't feel like there's anything I can do about it. Right. And again, that's just never who I've ever been in life. I've never been a person that's like, I have no power. I don't know what to do. You've also never lived through a global pandemic where society is collapsing. Mm -hmm. So let's also say that. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe it's not all your fault. (laughs) That's also what I'll do, though. I'll I'll be like, certainly it's all my responsibility. 
which that's a very much a child of trauma thing to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know what, if that's not what I want to be doing, but I do want to be doing something inside of media, there's this whole other arm that is for Chicago. And since I'm a Chicago activist, it feels really natural to just go with that. And so, Mm. and honestly, since taking those steps and sending out the communications that need to be sent out in in regard to making that shift, I have felt lighter. Good. Yeah. That's, I guess, one of the things I wanted to chat a little bit about too today, Mm -hmm. which is that feeling, that sense of feeling lighter when suddenly you make a choice or something gets lifted off of your plate, right? Because as I was getting my, you know, somatic teacher training and doing my own landmark personal growth, what I started to recognize in a very profound way, and I know that we all hear this, but in a real profound way, is that every single incompletion that exists for us in our lives exists as tension in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Well, you say that it was in a profound way that you were experiencing this. I'm guessing it was in an embodied way, which is what makes it profound. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you can start to really sense into your nervous system and what we do in somatic education is we basically circumvent the brain so much so that there's a period in a somatic session for integration where we stop. Yeah. We lay down and we just allow the brain to catch up with what it just discovered about what it's doing that it didn't know it was doing. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, and I was just so amazed at how very parallel it was with the cognitive sort of behavioral work we're doing in something like Landmark or even therapy, right? Mm-hmm. Versus, oh, like, no, the same rules exist on the cellular level of the body. Mm-hmm. That's why I love any somatic modality, especially ones that combine the top down and bottom up, Mm -hmm. right? And it's not necessarily cognitive behavioral, but thinking, obviously, cognition, being able to talk about one's experience and process it, but to be able to feel it and embody it both at the same time. Yeah. So you created your own little therapy situation (laughs) by doing those simultaneously. Honestly, I really did. And what was so funny is I took time off of my chiropractor at that period in time. And my chiropractor measures your height. And she also works in the world of the nervous Mm -hmm. system. So she kind of had an idea of what I was going to work on in the world of somatics. When I came back to her after like the certification was finally completed a year and a half, maybe later, and she took my height, she goes, you grew a quarter of an inch. And I was like, yeah. Sure did. Wow. Couldn't believe it. Like, you know, to just actually be in the releasing of tension and allowing rematrixing to happen in such a way because you're in it constantly because you're in a training. (laughs) Wow. So it's like hours and hours of somatics. It's like, oh, I grew a quarter of an inch in a year. Can you believe that? Yeah. Before I forget to ask this question, you've got like an intro to somatics video, right? Would you send that to me so that we can make sure to post it in the show notes so that listeners will be able to see that? And because I have a feeling that there'll be some people listening to this going, holy shit, how do I do this? What is it? Tell me more. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And it's so profound and it's so hilarious that I just wanted people to be able to do a reverse fly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I just want people to be able to do a reverse fly. And here you are, knowing your childhood trauma. (laughs) <laughs> and now here I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now here I am working with people who have had traumatic brain mm-hmm. injury, PTSD, you know, because one of our biggest referral partners are therapists. Right, right. You know, and it's incredible. Like I never thought that, that was going to be a thing. That was not the plan. Yeah. And then, you know, now here we are helping people feel their bodies, helping people really get in tune with how their bodies organize themselves, you know. So that begs the question, do, would you consider yourself a healer? Um, yes, I would at this point. And probably only because I had a client who had traumatic brain injury, who had massive success coming to me, mm. who called me a healer. Mm. And, and I was like, oh, yeah, I get it. And she's like, are you kidding me? She's like, I haven't been able to run in three years. And after six weeks with you, I'm running. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so. 
And then I like get all like teary eyed because movement is like life to me. Yeah. If you can't move, man, I'm just like, let me help you. Let me help you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what about the term wounded healer? How do you feel about that? I kind of have started to think that most people in the healing industry are wounded healers. On the nose. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's incredible because knowing that and being aware of that, I've always thought it was weird that I went into pain, like the relief of pain, because I never really dealt with chronic pain mm -hmm. personally. But it's just kind of like where the road took me. But pain comes from tension. Yeah. Tension comes from stress. I'm diagnosed general anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. So, of course, <laughs> mm -hmm. of course, I would be dealing in a, a modality that releases tension of the body. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had a therapist, my most recent therapist tell me like, oh, yeah, you know, all of your exercise. I have a feeling that a lot of that had to do with needing to get out all of that anxious energy somewhere. Absolutely. One hundred percent. And so like I've always used the exercise because I started exercising at the age of 12. Well, and uh, since I've gotten to do a couple of somatic sessions with you, I can also say because sometimes people think, OK, I'm an anxious person. I should be moving all the time. But there's so much value in slowing down and sitting and being with the anxiety that comes up when you're quiet. And that's something that I imagine comes up for people in somatic sessions, right? Because it's painfully slow if you are a fast person. <laughs> it is. It's outrageously slow. In fact, yeah. I had a client who I got really pushy. I got a little. I got really, I get really pushy. I'm very good at getting no. pushy. No, <laughs> no. Well, when I really see something, I'm like, hey, listen, I'm not attached. That's how I'll always, that's how I'll always, that's, that's when you know I'm going to try to push you into something. Yeah. Here, listen, I'm not attached to this. And here's what I think that you should do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so, mm -hmm. so I did have a client where I basically said that and she tried it out and she was like, I want to like flip out being that slow. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, of course, well, think about that, right? Like what's right. there for you of, around like slowing down, right? And that might be something important in what you're trying to discover for yourself. Mm -hmm. But also just with that understanding that I have to make sure to meet people where they're at. Yeah. Too, right? Because if someone wants to bolt every single time they're with themselves for, mm -hmm. you know, a short period of time, then like, well, maybe our somatic sessions are only 15 minutes to start. Yep. And send them to therapy and then mm -hmm. we'll send them back to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's how it all works. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's just like, you know, a little bit of titration for those people who have a hard time really being because the workshops that I teach are like 90 minutes long, which I think is kind of wild. I don't want to be in a 90 minute somatics class. <laughs> My weekly class is 45 minutes because I don't even want to be in an hour long class. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. <laughs> like, I'm like singing, you know, so it's like, mm -hmm. so yeah, for those of you who that seems like a daunting task, there's certainly, there's certainly something inside of shortening it, mm -hmm. doing what you can, being where you are. And I find having movement is really helpful in staying present. Mm hmm. You know, absolutely. Um, I think that there's a lot that people can really connect to in their brains that isn't like just your breath, right? Not that connecting with breath is a bad thing or anything. I don't want to give you that impression. That always makes me anxious. I've never been able to do that. If I have to think about my breathing, I'm going to like explode. Yeah. <laughs> the only time I'll do it is if I'm listening to someone who is prompting me. And with the somatic movement, what I get to do at any point in time is like, okay, let me shrug my shoulder. Okay, now very slow. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have to stop and think. I don't have to settle. You know, I can just do it, you know, and it'll mm -hmm. get me centered. It'll get me yep. in my body versus, you know, in my brain thinking about why can't I do this, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if it's okay with you and I have a feeling it is, I'd love to shift into more of the political stuff because I 
get the sense I feel this way. And so I'm guessing that a lot of listeners feel this way. Just like you described earlier, this feeling of I don't know what I can do. I don't know how I can help. And I think that you're a person who probably has a lot of wisdom, not just for what to do, but also how to be with that, you know, how to be with that fear and anxiety. (laughs) (laughs) My husband thinks it's the weirdest thing because I make silly noises all day, but my body makes noises, right? And so then I just have to express them, right? And so that was... That's what was there. Like, I don't know the answer to this question. Okay, so <laughs> let's just make noise for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, I do. I do in part. So first off, what I invite people to do is think about the one thing that just sets your hair on fire. Like the one thing that you really, really think the world needs more of or needs less of, like the thing that keeps you up at night. The thing that like, when you hear a story about it on the news, you're in tears. Think about that thing, right? And that's Mm. probably the direction you want to go in as far as like what cause to go for. That is so, so helpful. Mm. Yeah. I will never forget that now. And that's, I'm going to, thank you. (laughs) That was a gift to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's for so many people. I did a speech for about women right after the ele- the 2016 election. Mm. And it's always my first piece of advice. And it was my first piece of advice there is there are so many people in the world who want to do something who don't because they're stuck at there's too much to do. Yes. Yes. Mm hmm. But imagine if every single American, and and even the Americans that disagree with you, if every single American really put effort and time into what it is they really truly believed in, right? And then, then we would see a really big shift in our political body, basically. And so for me, it's always been an economic thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And so when I first got started in organizing, I started uh, the U.S. Uncut chapter of Chicago, Mm. which is still active. They still do their own thing. I'm no longer an active part of it, but I started it and I let it go after a minute. But it was about corporate tax loopholes, basically. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we shamed corporations for trying to avoid taxes. Wow. So that's so great. I love it. It's it's awesome. It was so fucking fun. <laughs> like standing outside of Apple, it was just me and my friend Jim, right? Because we were in a big organization, but we were strategic. Jim owned a printing shop. So we got these two massive flyers. Sometimes there were four of us, sometimes there were two of us, depending on the weekend. And every single Saturday in, in the summer, I think it was of 2008 or 2009, We stood outside of the Clybourne Apple in Chicago with a banner that was the length and the size of the Apple window. You know how the the side of the building is a window that basically said Apple tax dodgers, all of this stuff and how they were basically lobbying. And then we're handing out leaflets. Yeah. Basically lobbying our government to avoid taxes. Yep. And. That effort from U.S. Uncut, we were the Chicago chapter, but that effort from U.S. Uncut actually stopped that repatriation of funding because it was so embarrassing. So was every chapter was going to Apple stores and doing that? They weren't doing that. That was our ploy. Other people were going into the stores and changing the website on the computers. And it was our U.S. Uncut website. And the front page of the website was about how Apple is tax dodging. So then anybody who came into the store who would log into the computer to look at it, the first thing they saw was how Apple was uh, lobbying to tax dodge and bring in billions of dollars, you know? Brilliant. And uh, so it was just this whole very embarrassing campaign. And that was a very small group of people. Wow. Another thing that I worked on was Wolfpack. Talk about small group of people doing really big things, right? Wolfpack, it's a nationwide effort, state by state. We're trying to pass a resolution to get a convention of the states together so that we can get an amendment to the Constitution. So we would pass over Congress to Mm -hmm. do it because, you know, Congress is bullshit. Right. 
And so we pass over Congress to get an amendment to the Constitution to get money out of politics. Overturn Roe v. Wade, not Roe v. Wade, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. Keep that one. <laughs> let's keep that one. Uh, and let's actually solidify it actually with legislation. Right. Hello. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, McCutcheon, uh, Citizens United. Yeah. You know, to overturn Citizens United. Right. So, yeah. So that was another thing. And we passed it in Illinois. We were the third state to pass it. It's still an ongoing effort now in several other states. Mm. You see, like, I've always had an economic bent. I did do a little criminal justice stuff because that shit's crazy. That shit's crazy. Yeah. I can't even think about what goes on in our prison system without, like, getting so fucking pissed. Yeah. But, yeah. So think about that thing. Yeah. And then find an organization that's doing something about it because they're there. And now people look at me and they're like, I go to marches, I organize marches, I call people to go and like, hey, are you going to the thing? Hey, are you getting out to vote? Hey, are you, you know, I do all of that. I've done a lot of civil disobedience. I've been arrested. So I'm like the front man, right? And I think that the people like me always get all the glory because we're out there on the front line. But what people don't see are the people designing the websites, writing all of the copy, yeah. like doing all of the artwork for the protests doing the programming and managing everything that's going on, writing the legislation that we want to get passed, creating the demands that we want, the legal team to get us out of all of the arrest situations we get into, <laughs> right? There's so much mm-hmm. for every single person to do. Mm. So it's like, what is lighting your hair on fire and what do you want to do? Yeah. Wow. That's so helpful. It's so, 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 so helpful because I mean, it's like use your talent. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's something that I keep trying to remind myself that I might not be out doing the marches. I might not be doing the text campaigns, but you know what I'm doing? I'm educating people. I'm using my platform and giving other people space to share their platform so that we can create change. Because who knows how many listeners out there now are going to want to sign up for the People's Lobby or Wolfpack or, you know, some of these other organizations that you mentioned. Absolutely. It's all about amplifying and using the tools that you already have. Yeah. To create the change that you're really dedicated to, you know? Yeah. I even say like on the personal level inside of your one-on-one. Yeah. Everything as above is so below as within, so without, right? And so it's like if we as individuals are not doing the personal work that allows us Mm -hmm. to like look at each other as human beings and not as like, yeah, some other, we're just going to keep ending up in the same fucking place. I just started an embodied social justice course, which I'm so excited about. And in the intro call, the leader said, we want to educate you to the point where you are no longer able to be in your body and be okay with what's happening outside. 100%. Yeah. So that now this incorporation of the personal's political in therapy, and I'm not, I just want to say I'm not imposing my views on people, but what I'm doing in sessions is shining a light on what's happening for you is not just about you. It is interconnected with these systems of oppression that we've been suffering from. And it's coming to a boiling point right now. I talk with some clients about gender issues. And I've got one client who talked about getting accosted in bathrooms Mm -hmm. in fucking Chicago. Why? What? Mm -hmm. Get the fuck out, people. Why are people being such dicks? Like, we've got to change the world. This is not okay. People should be able to fucking use the bathroom in peace. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. And a lot of it does start at this political systems level. And a lot of it starts at the personal level. Right. So if we can... Come together. Yeah. What we really got to get is that whatever the work it is you've chosen to step into, yeah, bring that level of intentionality into it. Like, who am I being in this space? Right. So I'm doing, you know, I do the political show and it's so easy, so easy to sink into say like, oh, these people are immoral or these people are so bad or these people. Right. And I sit in my car before I walk into that studio and I remind myself like, who am I in the world Mm -hmm. and what am I creating? Yeah. You know, so that when I go on the show and the desire to make fun of somebody comes up or the desire to hate on somebody comes up, Mm. I can still express, be fully self-expressed around my opinion on something Mm -hmm. and not attack the human being. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. (laughs) 
Yeah. And that's honestly, especially where I am today in my crunchiness, it's really inspiring. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we weren't nearly out of time, but I need to respect yours and the listeners time and wrap us up here, but give people your links. Where can they find you? What shows? Tell everything. Okay. So um, comfyfitness.com is my fitness and movement company. Honestly, if you're dealing with chronic pain, you can try all of the other things and that's great. I don't think those modalities are wrong or bad, but the joke I always make is we're the stop people go to when they've tried everything. So if you're a person that's like, I've tried everything, yeah, come on over. ComfyFitness.com. We do everything virtually. And I have a location in Oak Park that I do see people privately if you want to see each other in person. Not necessary, right? We do live online classes. So we run live online classes 11 a week presently. And we do it in a gift economy because one of our highest values is access, accessibility. And so we give you several different prices to choose from. It's the same product. Just choose the price that you want to pay, right? Because I, we don't think that anybody should not be able to have the access to our work for financial reasons. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So that's comfyfitness.com. Check us out. We love to have a good time. And then there's thekimbra.com. That's really for you folks out there who have uh, businesses or projects that are big, big, and you need some sort of community and group to move that project along. We work inside of spaces where the focus is money, people, or time. And our membership gives you accessibility to all of those. So Mm -hmm. thekimbra.com, if that's something that sounds like it's good for you. Other than that, if you want to see me on Hardlands Media, you can check me out there. Hardlands Media on YouTube. We're also on Rockfin and Odyssey, which are some of the other like paid subscription platforms. But I'm going to be shortly moving over to Chicago Corner under the same like umbrella, media umbrella, but for Chicago, very Chicago centric news and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. And social media is comfy fitness, comfy underscore fitness for Instagram. Pretty easy to find me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about so much, but is there any, any kind of wrap up final thought you want to leave listeners with today? Oh man. Yeah, so many things, so many things. But I guess, you know, just remember that your reaction center is about 250 times faster than your action center. Mm. And so the sooner you can get in touch with your body, the sooner you can actually use its superpowers to start making your choices in a real way. Mm. Love it. Well, thank you so much. So fun. I'm so glad we finally did this. I told you, like I thought about it at least a year ago and I just am disorganized in my planning. So I'm so glad that you were like, hey, can I be on your show? Yeah, I do the same thing. I had it written down for a long time. Like I really want to, I want to go on podcasts because I want people to know about somatics because this is like one of the best ways to amplify this sort of thing. Yeah, And, and because there's a lot of education that goes into it too. So it's like this whole thing. Yeah. Finally, I revisited that list and I was like, let me do all the outreach again, you know, to to everybody I know that has podcasts. So I appreciate you picking up and I'm glad that we got it in. Awesome. You're so great. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. No, you're great. I'm so glad that we met. Me too. And I love that we have no idea how we actually met. I know. Like, who knows? It's all, it's so much a blur. We just ended up in each other's lives, (laughs) kind of. Right. Perfect. (laughs) That's all we need. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here, Kira. You got it. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much to Kira for being our guest today. If you'd like to learn more about Kira, you can go to our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. As always, thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Ben Mueller for our theme music, and to Liam O'Donnell for our album art. Until next time, bye-bye. 